So, uh, welcome everybody to uh, this talk, Underwater Photography Part 1. Um, I kind of changed it from when I had originally set it up. Originally I thought maybe I'll do a one part or two part, but um, I got a lot of positive feedback on the four part, um, uh, on the four part Lightroom series. So I thought I'd just make it a four part as well. We have the time. I actually could do more sessions um, uh, afterwards. So, um, you know, we're going to do four parts now and then we're going to just see how we go. Also, if you've already seen the uh, shark talk that I gave at, um, that I did at, um, at Dive Ninjas, then some of the things today will be repetition. Today I'm including macro and obviously other things, but the shark talk had a similar structure in the beginning. So apologize if it's a repetition, but it should be mostly new photos. So anyway, it's, we've got like over 120 photos today. So I think um, if you like photos, then it's going to be entertaining either way, even if it is a bit repetition. So just on Zoom, generally uh, your audio and video is off. Um, you can raise your hand. I can unmute you or allow you to speak, but uh, because we're now groups of 30, sometimes 40, sometimes 50 people, I just leave it all off in the beginning. Um, just use the Q&A and the chat to put uh, questions. The Q&A is the best, so um, there I can organize it a bit easier, but I'm going to try to keep both windows open. So if you uh, have questions to what I'm talking about and I feel like, you know, I should probably answer that, then I'll do that. And otherwise, we have plenty of time at the end to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so I think lots of you guys already know me, so I'm going to keep this short. My name is Simon. I'm German, but I live in Hong Kong already 12 years. Um, and I'm an underwater photographer, amongst other things. Uh, I do lots of things underwater. Um, and yeah, I'm a photo coach for quite a while. So you're getting now the uh, collected uh, uh, sort of wisdom of trying to help people with their photography for the last five years. Insider Divers, I think you guys also all know, we do liverboard and land-based scuba diving trips, but we also do specific trips like uh, for wreck diving or tech diving. But we also have free diving trips as well as specific photography workshops. If this travel thing gets uh, released, then we might do a workshop this summer still. Um, all of our trips are group trips. Um, there's always an expert, an insider uh, with you that makes sure that the itinerary is special and unique and worked out. Yeah? And we always focus on education and coaching. So talks like these is what you can expect on every one of our trips. Um, yeah, so today uh, we're going to talk about underwater photography. And let's just start with what is an underwater photo? Well, you can look at it in many ways. Simply, it could just be a reefscape, a picture of a reef and some fish. Um, it could be, you know, a large part of coral or, you know, a, a huge crack in a coral reef like here in Chuk. It can also be in a cave. This is in Mexico or here, the entrance of a cave. That's also an underwater photo. It can also be on a wreck. Wrecks are also great scenic places to dive and to photograph. It could be just in the blue water with no reef at all, just animals in the blue water or in black water at night yeah, or on a night dive. That can all be different kinds of underwater photos, I'm sure you're all aware. We photograph different kinds of animals, medium size, bigger size, very large animals like whale sharks. By the way, in this picture you can see three whale sharks and a, a manta ray, which is what you get when you go in August to uh, the north tip of Yucatan. Or something like this, like these humpbacks, yeah, so that's kind of the super large animals. But we also have small animals like rhinopias or mimic octopus or even smaller like a nudibranch um, or really, really tiny like this juvenile cardinal fish or super tiny where you can see these sheep nudie are literally not much bigger than the sand grains lying around them, right? So these are all things. We could also take people, pictures of people. Just a photo of a person can be nice or a photo in a certain specific habitat, like Kaylee will recognize this maybe, yeah? Jellyfish Lake in Palau, or a whole bunch of us in a photo, yeah? Every group trip with Inside the Divers, we always do a group photo, and uh, Anna, I know, is here uh, from this photo, so um, it's a great way to uh, practice your photography. I tell you, very stressful taking a picture of 11 people, but this was a great group. They all um, did the no bubbles perfectly. So I've structured the underwater photography talk in now into four segments and every two weeks we're going to do another one. So just looking at the list of people who are here, some of you will know some of these things already. So I hope it will be just nice photos and then we're going to get more technical in the next 
uh, section. So in the next section, we're going to go a bit more technical. We're going to talk about actually your photography, what are the differences between compact SLR, mirrorless, uh, lighting, etc. And then we're going to talk about manual mode because it's really difficult. Some people know what manual mode is and other people don't know at all what manual mode is. So I'm just going to spend that time. I wanted to do it today, but I thought it was a bit too much. So I'm going to do that next time. And we're going to talk about strobe lighting. So today I'm going to just touch really basic the beginning of light but artificial lighting properly we'll do uh, next time, which is the 11th of May. Then we'll do a whole session on macro, and I'll include black water in that, so that's going to be a lot more uh, focusing on the small things, and we can do another one, which is wide angle. And if you guys all send me, you know, inspiration or what other things you would like to talk about, like I have uh, rec photography, uh, um, I have uh, underwater people, I have all kinds of uh, topics that we can talk about, um, so, you know, but now for the next four weeks we have this and uh, let's see um, if that works out like that. So I like to talk about a killer shot. If you traveled with me, then you know this is what I like to talk about. That is the shot that you're proud of. That is a photo that you want to post on Facebook. That is a photo where you're jealous of when other people have one of those, right? And um, generally, I would like to say that if a photo is great or amazing, if it's really good, Basically, you can almost measure it with the amount of time that people look at it. So when you're going through your Facebook stream and somebody uploads a killer shot and you're just like, whoa, wow, okay, well, that is a big, that's a big picture, then you've taken a great photograph. That's something that people will repost, right? So that is the killer shot. So why do we actually look at a photograph? So what would increase that time of looking at a photograph? Well, one is maybe you see something, information, something you didn't know before, um, something that you haven't seen before, behavior, that would be information. The other thing it could be, be because it's just pretty, you know, it's a beautiful photo, it's just art, right? And that could be another reason why you would look at the photo. Another reason could be that it's something you haven't seen before, like a different style, a different solution, a different way of um, you know, capturing something. All of these are good reasons what would extend the time of looking at a photo. So obviously the longest would be the combination of them all, when all of three of them are combined. Right? And so that's uh, a little bit how I'm going to structure this workshop. But first I want to do one thing that is really, really important. I think that uh, too often people are just happy with getting a photo of something. And that is celebrating like you've got your first clear photograph of manta ray. But really what you should be looking at is you should be looking at trying to be able to say, I've got an amazing photo of a manta ray. So when you come out of the water and you're talking to your buddies, you don't want to say, yeah, I got some shot. You want to be saying, I got a really amazing shot, right? And then you've got the right mindset. If you're going to always try to go for that super photo, then you're going to get much better photos. So I'm going to summarize this in three, uh, sorry, four segments. I think that obviously the beauty is very important. Pictures need to be pretty in order to be, you know, something that we're going to look at for a long time. But I think story is extremely important and often overlooked. And so if you have a pretty picture and a story, you're already giving two reasons why people should look at your picture longer. So in the overlap of the two, you already have a lot more. But if you now add the factor of surprise in, like having a technical solution, something that people haven't seen before, now you're adding a lot of ingredients into it. So obviously the best is if you can be right there in the middle where, you know, you've got a beautiful picture that has an interesting story to tell and it is a new technique. But even if you just have two, that's already great. A pretty picture with a surprising technical solution could already be very interesting. So that is how I'm going to structure um, uh, this talk today. But there's one very important ingredient I'm going to add to it, which is you need to be ready to actually make these three things happen. So that's going to be the fourth part of what we're going to talk about today. So let's talk about beauty. On the left, you can see a photo that is for me truly was a big moment. It's the biggest whale shark I've ever seen. This was in uh, in Galapagos. This was a pregnant female, probably 14 meters. But you know, it's quite hard work getting there. There were other people swimming around. It's not a great photo. On the right, there's a whale shark like I've seen many of them. But here, the photo is just much, much better, even though it's just, you know, a whale shark. And also, this whale shark has a lot more story to tell because you can see the parasites 
and the expression on the face. So it's a lot more on this photo. So I would say the right one is much better. So let's talk about what makes a beautiful photo. So nice and clear forms is good. You can do a lot with color and contrast. You want a subject, you want to separate your subject and you want to work on framing. So I'm going to just go through a whole bunch of photos and show you what I mean with that. So here are some forms. It's not just a whole bunch of jackfish, it's jackfish swimming in a circle. So that's an interesting form. Or these big eyes making a sort of elliptical shape makes a really nice photograph in my opinion. Or this octopus shot in a way that makes the, the roundness of his habitat really good. Also a very nice form. Or a sea lion or a sea, yeah, a sea lion sw swimming in a circle making sort of this form. A thresher shark you know, not just the usual, look, I've got a tail. Here, I really like this photo because it's got an, a shape that is just really nice to look at. Even in Rex, you can have really nice shapes. This is one of the, uh, this is the Betty Bomber in Truck Lagoon. And, you know, if you look into it, you can see, obviously, man-made shapes that can make a very nice and attractive photo. Mother Nature can be super elegant. So if you can capture the elegance, uh, Kaylee, this was shot in Palau, my first blackwater dive on the siren I think now five years ago um, and uh, and you know jellyfish is something that people are often uh, afraid of because they're afraid to get stung but actually it's a very elegant part of mother nature and so if you can shoot it in a way that it's elegant looking then you've got a nice photo as it is an octopus you know in a swimming form makes for a nice photograph manta rays uh, you know, barrel feeding under the boat in the Maldives is pure elegance, right? There's also story in there, but it's in first and foremost, it's an elegant photo. Colors are really good, you know, when you have colors jumping at you really strongly in your face, like this is in Raja Ampat, then, you know, you really get a great effect. Here, like a sunlight shot, this is South Africa, with dolphins cruising through the, through the uh, you know, the lowering sun, really, really great colors. That makes the photo in itself. If you can separate the subject, so you've got a shark in blue water, if you shoot it in the right way that the, the, the shark actually you know, separates itself from the background, then it makes it very nice to look at because the subject stands out. If you're looking at colors that contrast, so for example, red coral, if you shoot them against more red coral, it doesn't pop out. But if you shoot it against blue light, so you angle the camera in a way that you've got blue light, then it's much stronger. Or here, this was uh, a session where I was taking sunset shots uh, with, um, with some sharks and yap. But the sun had already gone down, but then I held the camera other in a different angle and you uh, got the lights from the boat. And that actually made for a very nice uh, uh, lighting in the top half where the color is totally different than the shark or the water. So you want to try and isolate your subject from the background. You can see here already on the right side is blue, on the left is black. This coral that normally in itself might not be that attractive because it's standing out so much against the background makes it makes it very attractive. So look for forms, colors and contrast and try to keep your subject separate. That's going to make a pretty photo. But we're going to get a little bit more technical with framing. And framing is really, really important um, because that makes a photo easy, digestible for your viewers. So you're making a pretty photo only by arranging it in the right way. So here is a photo and, you know, like many years ago, I probably would have been totally happy with this photo. You know, it's sharp, it's crisp. Um, also Palau, I think, by the way. And, um, but if you think about it, he's kind of not here, not there. That's because here I do what many people do and what you often do is you just try to get the subject in the middle, right? And that's what we call bullseyeing. And that's how you see me in the webcam right now. I'm right in the middle. That is not really that interesting. What's much more interesting is if you follow the rule of thirds with a lot of extra little framing rules that I'm going to go through with you, right? So you can see I just did this via crop. Just to show you the difference between bullseyeing and rule of thirds already looks a lot more pleasant on the right side, and I'll explain why that is. Rule of thirds is a classic uh, uh, teaching in artwork, like how to structure your art, like these um, um, Salvador Dali paintings, to structure them in a way that the viewer can consume the information comfortably. Here we've got a manatee in Florida, 
And I'm just going to show the rule of thirds with this manatee. So essentially you separate into nine identical rectangles and essentially you want to organize your key subject, the thing that is most important about your picture, along the crosshairs. So one or two or three of the crosshairs or along the sections that connect these crosshairs. Right? So this manatee you could argue is maybe, you know, along it's the eye is very close to that right turn section but the mouth area here is also along this segment right now you can see that i'm not using this top left uh focus point and that is because that is what we call negative space sorry sorry animation is not right i'm going to get to the negative space in a moment here you see there's people in the background but they're further away that's what we call negative space first if you turn the camera around obviously it works the same way Right, so you can just do the rectangles same, just turn it with the uh, the picture. And again, you want to be organizing the key points of your subject along those crosshairs. So now we come to the negative space. So here we've got a zebra crab sitting on the fire coral, and you can see is clearly on the bottom right hand crosshair of the uh, rule of thirds. So that's a good arrangement. We've got the main subject just clearly on one area there. But you can see that this background here actually makes the picture additional information. It creates a depth of field. It creates negative space, or negative space creates perspective. Negative space is what we call it and creates perspective. If you look at this next photo of the bull shark, you can see the bull shark. And the bull shark is, you know, again, organized on sort of the left or the bottom across sort of line. But you see in the top right hand corner, we've left the negative space and that allows that brain to make it a more three-dimensional picture. It allows you, your brain to be like, okay, so there's my subject right here, and this is the environment in which he is. It, even though it's a two-dimensional image, it creates depth of field, it creates therefore a third dimension, and that is quite important to make a picture interesting. So we want to leave that space, but also we want the animal to be moving in the right direction. So when you're framing a, a, an animal, you want to make sure that that animal is looking into your picture and not out of it. Because if you do it the other way around and the animal is looking out of the picture, it looks kind of weird. It looks like this fish is going to bump his head on the wall that's the end of the picture. right? So you want to try and get the fish to not look away from the picture but into the photo. Right, like here, you've got the pygmy seahorse, and the pygmy seahorse is looking into the picture. That makes it very interesting. And you can see also the negative space in the background. You can see that the uh, the background is sort of a fuzzy uh, part of the coral, which allows you to see the kind of habitat that the uh, animal is living in. Uh, Teresa is asking if uh, you have to put the eye on the corner. No, you don't have to. It's not a. It's not an exact science. It is. It is actually just an arrangement to try and see where you put your main elements. Like the eye of the fish shouldn't be far outside that inner square, for example. That generally would not be good. But your key thing, like this pygmy seahorse, right? If you would do the rule of thirds, the eyes are actually in the middle but the whole body is more centered, the belly is centered around the crosshair, so it works. So one thing that I find is if you don't have the person, the animal looking into it, you still want to give it that space, that space that it can swim into, because otherwise it would feel very unnatural if it has nowhere to swim. So if the picture ends right in front of the head of the animal, and it's kind of like, you know, like a turtle is swimming, it kind of looks weird if we don't give it that space. In in uh, above water photography we'd call it breathing space, right? Or or a bleed. But here we're talk I call it swimming space because we're underwater. Like here we've got a whale shark's really filling up the picture, but it is good if you still leave a little bit more on the left hand side than on the right hand side. Because that gives us this feeling the animal is not swimming in the wrong direction. So if you're leaving a bit of space, then that is better even if you have animals that are not moving, obviously seahorses are not moving, but they, you know, they look like they're moving to somebody who doesn't know seahorses that well. So it's better if you leave some space here, otherwise it looks like this seahorse is going to run into a wall. So generally you want to keep some space there. Right? Then there's this concept of diagonals. And some people are really, really strict on diagonals. And they say, if you don't have a diagonal, it's not a good photo. I don't agree with that. I think a diagonal is an interesting aspect to a photograph, 
right? It also breaks very often with the rule of thirds, so you can't always use the, uh, the, the diagonals. But essentially what the diagonal is, is the connection of the two middle crosshairs. And by creating a diagonal, so something that is breaking our square photo sort of with a cross, that makes a lot of dynamic, right? It makes the picture, yeah, in a way interesting. There is, there's, there's gravity and motion working for it. So if you have sort of cross lines that you can see, like here the fish and the coral, there's good sort of corner to corner lining, then it makes the picture more dynamic. Here you can see the manta rays in this first one. I don't know if everybody sees that, but to me, I see a I see a diagonal. If you see the tail and the direction of the swimming, there is a di diagonal there. And you could go wingtip to wingtip. You you would have a cross diagonal. So uh, this is a, a, a great technique, and lots of photos look really great. But if all of your photos had diagonals, I don't think it would look very attractive. So it's just you know one way of making a picture extra interesting. There are, of course, exceptions. So, um, you know, similar to the question that, that was just asked uh, by Teresa, you know, you don't always have to do the rule of thirds because sometimes you've got so large subjects that it just makes no sense in trying to push them to one corner or if you're going for symmetry. So, for example, here, right, you've got a huge whale shark. Now, I could try and put a rule of thirds there and argue that there is some sort of connection with the crosshairs, but there isn't. The whale shark's filling the picture. And so that's good enough. You know, you don't always have to do it. If the subject is too large, then that's fine. Symmetry is a typical example, you know. If you can kind of cut it in half and feel like the two, the two sides sort of mirror almost, then clearly you don't need to really use the rule of thirds. Although you could see that if you would put a rule of thirds in both pictures, you would still see that the head here, for example, is probably on, on one of the connection lines. And if you would put a, a, a rule of thirds on this uh, seahorse, then maybe the eyes would be roughly in the right area. Right? So that is uh, uh, some flexibility if you use symmetry. But there are more rules. You know, I wouldn't be your German friend if I wouldn't introduce some more rules. There are some more things that are important to keep in mind. So we talked already about the subject separation, so if you've got good color difference between the background, but very important when you're doing that is also to let that color be fully surrounded around the subject. The subject should be complete. Very often I see photos um, that people show me and it's a perfect picture, but something's cut off and that's not good. You really want to avoid cutting off anything of the animal. I generally call it cutting off essentials. Right, so you've got a great harlequin shrimp here, but, and this is my original photo, so all these messed up photos are also my photos, yeah. So this is a photo that you cannot use. You cannot use a photo where, you know, a little bit is missing of something that's an integral part of the animal. Like here, I'm cutting off a wing tip. That's already bad. I'm also cutting off a tip there on the right-hand side, but I'm also cutting off the remora. That's just not good form. Both of these need to be fully in the picture, Otherwise, it just seems like you're cutting off, you know, it doesn't feel like easy to look at. So that's why you want to make sure you avoid cutting off essentials. If you're going to cut the animal, I always like to say cut with conviction. Like make sure like, like it's properly cut off. The whale shark's half gone. Then it doesn't look like you accidentally cut off a, a tip. Like here, you can see I just accidentally cut off a wing tip and the remora is just poorly done. But here... It's so done with, 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 you know, with the planning, because that's how I wanted to do the split shot, so then it's acceptable. Right? Here you can see it's the, the picture is meant to be a detailed photo of the sand tiger, and so therefore it's okay to cut the whole part of the body away. Yeah? Here's another sand tiger, and you can see a big problem with this picture. Right? It's two-dimensional. It's a side shot. Right? So there's no depth of field. There's no feeling of how big this animal could be. There's also no dynamic because it's totally across, so we don't have any any uh, 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 you know dynamic uh, uh, diagonals. So uh, it doesn't give us any sense of this animal. The same animal, just literally on a different part of the same reef. Here I'm shooting it from the front, and he's looking into the camera. That makes the picture much much stronger. So generally, if you can create the feeling that the animal is looking at you, you're creating a bridge between the animal and, uh, and, the, and the viewer, right? So for example, when we, um, when we 
In the third section, we can talk about macro, and you know, we're going to talk about nudibranchs. You know, which direction the 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 two antlers look is very important. If they look away, it still doesn't look like you're communicating with your subject. So make sure you try and get the animal to face the camera. Here we've got a wonderpus. You know, he's looking at us, although you know he's actually with his almost 360 degree vision with his eyes, not really looking at me. It looks to me as if he's looking at me. And you get extra bonus points if you get both eyes in, right? So here we see both eyes, we get a facial expression, but he's still angled in one area. So it's a very nice arrangement for an, uh, a shot. Totally avoid these photos, right? Like this is a lost photo. This is what I call an ass shot, okay? So when, you're, when the animal has passed you, you know, by all means take photos, but don't post them on Facebook because that's not a photo. That just says, I saw a oceanic white tip, but you didn't actually get a nice photo of the oceanic white tip, right? Even this here, this is also an ass shot, right? Although it's, you know, quite a nice achievement to get one of these things in focus on like a moving, you know, on a, on a moving whip coral, they're literally like two millimeters big, right? But it's still shot from behind. So literally, you know, it's not okay. Right? So make sure you try to always angle yourself so that the, it looks like the animal is looking in your general direction. Another thing that you can't do is you can't, you know, use photos where you messed up the focus. Like here, I, I, I focused on the uh, on the um, rhino for, um, on the nudibranch, the 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 lungs. But what should have been really in focus would be the head area. Right? And so that just doesn't work. So if you didn't get the focus, don't use the photo. So that was quite a lot of like do's and don'ts. Um, the next one is much more fun, the next segment. So this is just a couple of things to keep in mind. Your rule of thirds, your diagonals, don't like bull eye your photo. Uh, make sure you've got some breathing or swimming space. Try to get the animal to look at the camera or at least generally swim in your direction and avoid cutting off ass shots and, and, and other things, right? So um, one thing that is good about the rule of thirds is that when you crop in Lightroom, some of you guys have been in my Lightroom seminars, when you crop in Lightroom, you immediately get your rule of thirds. So when you're doing your 10, 20, 25% percentage crop, you can actually start moving it so that your rule of thirds works better. So keep that in mind when you're using Lightroom. So what makes a great photo? We talked now about beauty, so let's talk about story. Beauty is pleasing to the eye, story is where it's actually informative. And for me, that is the nicest part. Like for me, when I see a photo which has, you know, like a really interesting story, that makes, uh, you know, an amazing experience. So a photo with a story is basically all kinds of different aspects. Could be animal behavior, could be their habitat, mating, hunting, or interactions with humans. So I'm going to show you lots of examples of what I think are pictures that are rich in story. Here's a picture that, you know, is a, you know, a nice photo of a dolphin. Who doesn't like a dolphin? It's a bottlenose dolphin. But the same bottlenose dolphins in this much worse picture, this was deeper, it was darker, this was in Socorro, right? These two bottlenose were playing with the tail of the giant manta, right? So there's much more story in this picture than there is in this one. This one is just a dolphin, okay, they always look happy, you know, we all love dolphins. But essentially, this is a much more interesting photo because there's something really interesting going on there. Other things that you can think about is habitat. So here are some uh, uh, snappers that live in uh, these wrecks in, in Mexico, or here, this is in um, uh, this is in Science Tunnel in Palau, one of my favorite spots. There's always these like for years I've been going there and there's always these jacks there um, and so here I one time got in there by myself before the rest of the group came and I could actually get the way that they form uh, in in this uh, in this cave entrance right um, an octopus living in a bottle right I'm showing here how the octopus lives he might not really you know realize that it's glass and I can see him but we can see how he would live inside you know a uh, a cave or a crevice like this. Here we got like a pick me uh, Denise, right? And you can see the environment that she's living in and how well she's adapted to it. Camouflage is generally a very good topic, right? Here you've got the uh, the tasseled wobbegong in Triton Bay is really well camouflaged and obviously we can all see him but we can also see how he blends in and so the camouflage is a really nice part of the story. 
Here I'm actually showing the camouflage in a bit better way, so actually trying to highlight the stargazer, because otherwise you know you wouldn't see him in the sand, but you can still see the flatness of his head and how he would be disguising himself. You can try to tell a story by showing the size. You know, when I saw my first hairy frogfish, I was really surprised. I always thought that they were huge. I thought they were like, you know, like giant uh, frogfish. And then you see them and you realize, wow, a big one is literally this big. So one time I got one in Lembe or yeah, it was in Lembe where, you know, one was walking across a leaf. And this is not the most beautiful picture I've taken of a, a hairy frogfish, but it is one where you can actually tell the story of how large he is because he's not really not that big. You can also emph emphasize size. So by putting uh, this, in this case, my wife, on the other side of the manta ray, you actually make the manta ray even bigger. I mean, this is a giant manta ray. They are probably like four or five meters across, but if you shoot it in the right way, you can emphasize size even more. You can have all kinds of interesting behavior that makes a photo really interesting. Like here, you've got fighting. Here, you've got farting. Yeah, if you can't see it, if you're watching it on your phone, this is a manatee farting in Mexico. Yeah. Um, this is a honeycomb moray eel swimming. We always see them in the cave. You know, photos of moray eels in the cave are pretty much all the same. But, you know, here in the Maldives, uh, in, on this specific dive in the fish tank, they just come out and you can actually get a full, huge moray eel swimming around freely. Or this is a Wabagong in Raja Ampat. You know, we always see them on the bottom. Actually seeing them swim is an interesting story. Social life can be interesting. These are the, uh, uh, the uh, white tip reef sharks in Socorro. There's not much place to live, so they all sit on top of each other and they're very sort of friendly to each other, it seems, right? Or here, a pod of uh, uh, pilot whales in Sri Lanka. You know, they are also a family and you can see that they're swimming together. It's a, it's a, it's a story about social interaction. Or this are the thousands of mobula rays that get together in Baja, California. That is a story of social getting together. Right. Obviously, social life can go further. You know, you meet and then you fall in love and then you mate. Like these two mandarin fish at Sam's Walls in Palau. Yeah, so um, that is a story of re reproduction and mating, right? Here you've got another one from Palau. Palau is really, you know, like a red light district for fish. So here you've got the uh, bump parrot parrotfish fish spawning. Here you've got the uh, red snappers spawning. That's all in Palau, by the way. But that's a great story. That's why one of the many reasons I love going there, because there's just so much story to tell. Once the eggs are laid, some fish actually um, take care of the eggs, right? So all clownfish will take care of the eggs. So if you know that clownfish do that, you can try highlighting how they do that. It took me forever to take this photograph, you know, with a snoot on the, on, the, on the eggs, and then you have to wait until the clownfish comes in and cleans the eggs. Or here, you know, a yellow goby with yellow eggs. I mean, I love these guys, right? And that's a great story. You know, you have the yellow mother with the yellow babies. I mean, that is a great story in itself. Or the mantis shrimp protecting the eggs, you know. Um, or the egg by itself. This is a, a flamboyant cuttlefish in its egg, right? That's great. And then when they come out, they look like this and childhood begins. This was a, uh, a, a, a flamboyant cuttlefish baby. You can see it's like teeny tiny. And it just swam in front of my dive guide at the end of a dive. So it was a lucky shot. But this is the beginning of this flamboyant cuttlefish life. Or this baby shark, you know, is already a great thing because we've seen so many pictures of, um, uh, of, of gray reef sharks, but actually seeing a super young baby in detail is in itself already a story. Cleaning behavior, you know, this is uh, where David lives. This is here in uh, Karang Makassar in, uh, in uh, Komodo and you can see the yellow butterfly fish cleaning the manta ray or here this was this year in Raja Ampat where we got really nice and close you could see how the the butterfly fish were picking you know around the eye of the manta ray so that is uh, all a story of cleaning if you get them feeding this is in the Maldives where they feed right or you know marine iguana in Galapagos not just seeing the marine iguana but seeing that they're actually vegetarians eating the algae you know that is a story that is worth telling or a shark, you know, obviously this is like a shark feed, but you know, seeing a shark like fully get their teeth out is also a story. It can be debated if you like, you know, uh, baited shark dives, but you get photos like this, otherwise you would never get those. Right? 
You can also go for details, you know, like the teeth, the tongue of teeth that the nurse shark has, or the juvenile Pinatus batfish, you can see the teeth. I mean, that thing is like this big, you know, and getting the details out is a story in itself. Seeing the way the line is formed, you know, that's, that's already a story in itself. Or something like this, I don't know if anybody recognizes what this is. This is the eye of a cone snail, which is evolutionary how eyes of octopus and such developed, which were just the top ends of the antlers, which developed light receptors, and finally they actually developed into what looks like a human eye if you focus on it with a hundred millimeter and an extra diopter, you know. Another way of telling an interesting story is showing how humans and and animals interact or coexist. You know, like here we've got the, you know, the famous crocs from Chinchorro. It's not just the croc. You've also got the photographer, the topside photographer, and you've got the, the handler who's, you know, teasing with uh, a lionfish on the line. That's a lot of story in one picture. Yeah? Or here, this was our guide in uh, this year in Sri Lanka who jumped in for this one dive and he just got right on the other side of the blue whale, which just makes this picture, you know, the two species coming together, makes it a very powerful thing when you have humans in there. So what you try and do is actually have multiple story elements in the picture. So here, um, this is one of my favorite dive sites in Southwest Rocks, East Australia, you can see that not only do we have a nice lit up, you know, main subject, which is a sand tiger, you can also see this canyon, which is basically enabling this situation where the sand tigers can hang out during the day and, and not have to go into the big currents. And you get all the other guys swimming around in the back. So that has multiple elements. Or here, this is Kate uh, in, in the Maldives, right? You've got a baby black tip. We've got my wife. We've got, you know, the resort and the palm trees and the blue sky. There's a lot of stuff in there in one picture. You, you talk about juvenile uh, black tips that like to live in the shallows in front of uh, uh, you know, sandy beaches, but also that humans can get close, that, you know, it's right next to where people sunbathe. I think there's a lot of story in there. And so if you try and achieve that, that you're trying to get multiple elements of a story covered, then you make a very informative, interesting photo to look at. So try and say two to three things with a photo. Try to convey the background. You know, when you uh, uh, are told that, you know, whatever, uh, certain animals behave in a certain way, try to represent that with the photo, um, try to cover it with the photo, then you get a rich photograph that, that will, will be much more interesting for people to look at. Try to avoid, you know, what people often say is like, oh, here, look at this photo, you know, I mean, you can't see it right now, but you have to, you have to believe me, it was really amazing. That, then you might, not, might as well not show the photo, right? You want to try and share a photo where people are like, oh my God, wow, okay, that's amazing. Those would be the kind of photos that you want to get, yeah? So now we've got a pretty picture. It's pleasing to the eye. We've now got the story as well. So let's talk about the surprising aspect. And surprise is what I like to call technically interesting. Right? So what can be surprising? It, anything can be surprising. It can be the way you've arranged things, the angle on how you shoot it, the way you light up your subject, um, framing, anything technical that people haven't seen, anything artsy that people haven't seen, anything that is new is good. New is good. New is going to get you attention from people, is going to get you essentially into the final round of competitions. So one thing that's totally underused, in my opinion, you know, I mean, I go diving with, you know, 14, 15 groups of people uh, all around the year, and how few people actually take portrait pictures is always beyond me. So easy. If you've got a situation, like here on the left, this is the night dive in Kona, Hawaii, you just turn your camera to the side, and you just get an interesting photo. It's not that unusual above water obviously our phones we take you know vertical photos all the time but underwater it's extremely rare how people how rare people actually turn the camera around so that's the easiest way of making an interesting photo you can shoot subjects from above so this is a shark from above you know that's a nice form to look at an animal with the you know an ocean burst in the bottom or this is a cave up right so shooting a cave against the top making this sort of like, you know, like New York in a fish eye kind of impression. Or this is like shooting along the belly of a manta ray in a cleaning station is also an unusual angle that shows more the life of the cleaner fish, the rats and the butterfly fish 
in their sort of daily routine of cleaning the manta rays, right? It's a different angle. Other things can be a sunburst. I mean, this photo is also good because this super weird sweetwater turtle, but it's coming out of the sunburst. That makes it a very interesting thing. So sunbursts, if you can plan for them, they make for a really nice, uh, you know, punchy picture. Obviously, splits are good and a lot of hard work. If you've ever tried working on splits, it's a topic for itself. I'll talk about it in the wide angle session. There's quite a lot of things to think about when you're shooting splits, and I'll cover that in the wide angle session. You can work with super wide aperture. So, you know, when you're doing with your macro lens and you take your 60 mil and you just shoot with, you know, 7.1 or even 5.6 aperture, you can get extremely a lot of crap, but you can also create really interesting photos like this, where the rhinophore of the nudibranch is literally just like a, a blurb in a multicolor background. I mean, I, personally, I love this one. Yeah. Um, you can work with slow shutter. That's something I'll cover as well in uh, the wide angle. If you use the slow shutter nice, you can also tell a story with it. Like here, this is in this dive that I showed earlier in Florida, the shark dive, and these are the sharks the lemon shark swimming around the handler who still got some bait there in this box. That is an interesting effect creating dynamic, but I'm actually using the camera to create more dynamic. So I'm actually moving the camera along. Here I'm actually zooming the camera out. So I've got like a 10 to 17 Tokina lens and with a slow shutter, I'm zooming out and I get this sort of like calling for Batman sign. So, you know, techniques they can use with slow shutter where people are like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, in macro, for example, you've got a snoot, right? Snoot, classic, you can already make very interesting results just like this. This was with a compact camera and a snoot. You can make the mimic, who looks just like the sand, stand out, look much more interesting. And particularly if you know this animal, the two antlers uh, on top of their eyes are very specific to this and the wonderful species. And so these pop out so much more just by using snoot lighting. You can also do backlighting. So here I just laid a torch on the sand and the lionfish swam around it, creating like sort of a background uh, uh, for this particular photo. You can use the snoot to do backlight. So here I'm using a snoot and I'm putting it behind the uh, ribbon eel and the light passes through the ribbon eel getting to the camera. So you can create an interesting effect like this. Or here I did it with a, a, a zebra crab. Or here I did it very extreme. Somebody else took my strobe with the snoot and angled it on eye level so that we got this ghost pipe fish. I call this x-ray style. Yeah. And you, you light them up. Like otherwise, ghost pipe fish always look the same. And here we've got an unusual way of taking a photo of it. So these are surprising techniques that you can use. Obviously, on your computer, you can do lots of interesting things. Like here, this is a picture of a uh, a school of barracudas, but you know, I played around trying to get this Christian Weisel effect and you know, essentially this came out of it and we liked it so much that we printed it and hung it up in our house. Here is, uh, uh, Kaylee, I don't know if you've ever seen this, this is a panorama of the uh, Big Blue Holes dive site in, in Plow, and it's so huge, this cave, that people usually always just have parts of the cave uh, photographed, but I just went into this big sort of dark corner and did a series of five photos. And then when I was done with that, a lionfish came up. So I took that, that last slice a few more times and then stitched it all up in Lightroom. And here we go. We've got a photograph that has all the openings of uh, uh, blue holes covered in one photo, right? Again, interesting, new people haven't seen it before. So an interesting approach. Here is uh, one, one time we went to Lembe, you know, we do the yearly workshop and, uh, and that year we brought for the first time different backgrounds. So I went here in, in Hong Kong. I went to, to Mong Kok, which is the area where you can buy like textiles and things like that. And I bought all kinds of different like glitter uh, uh, materials that are meant for costumes and dresses and whatnot. And then we would place them behind the animals, shining lights on them, creating what I call disco bokeh. Right? And so that in itself made a new picture. And I call this picture, your head, put your hands up for Detroit because, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, frogfish is putting his angler up as well. And the light reflecting from the disco lights is going through the, uh, the angler. 
So that, there we go. So now we've got three different things. As I mentioned, you know, if you can bring them all together in one photo, you get a very strong photo. Here you've got a photo from uh, Arborek Jetty in uh, in Raja Ampat, and there is a there's a a ball of uh, clown, uh, an enemy with clownfish in there. So I tried for a really long time actually sticking my camera right underneath that uh, that ball, and then I had to wait until the clownfish all came to this bottom side of the anemone. But now we've got an, a picture that has interesting angle. It's pretty because, you know, clownfish are always pretty. But we also have got an unusual angle and it's technically good because we've got a sunburst. Also, we're telling a story about how these clownfish live under the jetty, a man-made jetty, right? So we've got everything covered in there. So that makes it a very good photo. Would I win any award with this? Probably not because you know what? That's never a guarantee. The photo that's been most successful, so that's the biggest award that I've won so far, was with this picture, and I got a couple of uh, smaller awards with this one as well. It's just, just a mimic octopus, uh, sorry, wonderpus, a juvenile wonderpus on a blackwater dive, right? And definitely it's pretty. Is there a story? Well, like every blackwater picture, there's a story that, you know, it's a juvenile animal swimming in the dark, so it's not really a big story. I, I might see a little bit of story that you can see the beginning of these two uh, antlers that I was talking about earlier. You can see them here on this juvenile, but it's not really a big story. Neither is it technically surprising. I mean, there's thousands of uh, these pictures out there, but, you know, sometimes you just have a photo that's just beautiful and that's good enough. So if you try and achieve at least one of those really well, and then you get a little bit of the other one in, then you're getting really close to, uh, you know, getting the really sharp photos. So here we go. Those were the three things that I wanted to put together for a killer shot. But you, you remember there was a fourth part. And the fourth part is where I find often it fails, particularly, particularly in wide angle. So in macro, the advantage is that the things don't move. That's why we do our photo workshops always in macro destinations because it's just easier to learn the camera, learn the settings, learn the different techniques and do it all with time because, you know, a nudie brank just doesn't move that far. So the most important part that you need to have for wide angle photography definitely is that you're ready to actually turn all this around when the opportunity presents itself. So this last part is about being ready. I'm going to talk about buoyancy, a bit about mindset and approach. I'm just going to start talking a little bit about light. As I mentioned, we're going to do a lot more in the next section. And I'm going to give you my secret tip at the very end of this talk, which um, you know is my, my tip that I give all the people that dive with me. So first is buoyancy. So here you can see my buddy Dan hovering over the reef, and he's got perfect buoyancy. He is comfortable with moving his camera and everything without touching the reef at all. And so he's getting close to get uh, the picture of the turtle. But very important is that you first make sure that you got your buoyancy right, that you're not touching the reef, you're not destructing anything, you're not, you know, getting your fins close to them, and then you take your photo. So make sure that as a photographer, you always say reef first, photo second. But with that good buoyancy, you're not only protecting the reef, you're also holding the camera steady. For those of you who still remember how when they first started with photography, you know, as soon as you start concentrating on the picture, you hold your breath. It's just automatic, you know, above water to keep your hand stable, you also hold your breath. So by holding your breath, you're actually rising, right? And then you're suddenly like, oh, shit, I got to exhale. And then you exhale and then you drop again. So if you get your buoyancy right, so if you practice small, shallow breathing and use it to uh, hold your buoyancy, you can also hold the camera steady much better. You're also controlling backscatter because you're not creating, uh, you know, lots of sediment by moving around, kicking your fins. You're getting the animals relaxed because if you're steady, they're not going to feel threatened by you. Whereas if you're kicking the whole time or pushing yourself off the ground or even worse, touching the reef, the animals are going to feel that you're intruding on their, on, their, um, on their habitat. And finally, it makes it easier to make good framing. If you're nice and comfortable and you can just take a photo, snap. It's much easier to get it framed in the right way than when you're like struggling the whole time with your buoyancy. That's why I generally recommend on our trips, on your very first dive of the trip, you shouldn't take your camera. I try to 
like do that for myself as well on the first dive of the trip I don't take the camera and we just make sure you know is the equipment good do I still have all my buoyancy tricks right sometimes the water is more saline or less saline than where you dived last or your computer is still set to nitrox and we're diving air or whatever all these things are going to influence your camera so why don't you just leave the camera behind on the first dive another one that you know many people do wrong is taking a picture from above right so here on the left you see a photo that i took very early days with my first snap camera first time i saw a nudibranch in hong kong you know i took a photo from the front and what does it look like it looks like a discarded piece of orange that's because i've got no perspective to the animal so you never want to shoot down on an animal unless that's your creative style of, you know, trying to get an angle on it. What you do want to do is you want to get eye level with the subject. And with eye level, I mean literally eye level, which means your lens and the eyes of the, cam of the animal should be aligned or you should even be below. That are the two angles. Everything else is going to make it less interesting. So try and keep that in mind that you always level yourself with the eyes. Another thing is the approach. I think, or I hope that you can see that when I talk about the story of all the different of the, all the different animals, I actually know what the animals are doing, and I'm trying to get that into a picture. That is, if you actually think about how you're going to convey this story, you read up about it in advance. You know that you're going to see manta rays cleaning, so you can read up on it in advance and be like, "Well, this is what manta rays do. This is how I'm going to try to." capture the situation then you get there and you want to make sure that you actually look at the animal and see okay how can I make this work right maybe it means that you don't go directly for the animal but you swim somewhere else I'll cover that in the next uh, part as well and then it's important that you plan your settings if you're shooting automatic mode guys I'm sorry to say the next session is where I'm going to convince you to change that right you need to shoot in manual mode and manual mode only I'll discuss a little bit of your uh, sort of why you shouldn't use aperture priority and shutter speed priority uh, next time, but I don't recommend it. You should be shooting full manual. And that is comes in line with trying to understand the light. You need to understand what does what for your picture. And the essence of photography is essentially light. That's what you will see that everybody, every big photographer will always say photography is all about light. In fact, photography can only happen with light. The reason we see anything is a light source is reflecting off the subject and it's coming to our irises or to the photo. So light is the most essential thing. But we underwater need to separate ambient light and artificial light because these two come together. Almost everybody is taking photos underwater with strobes. And if you're not, you know that you're missing something because underwater, we need to use artificial life in most situations to create interesting photography. And there is often a misunderstanding of what does what. And here in this picture, you can see very easily what is ambient light. Ambient light is what the sun does. So the sun is lighting up this blue uh, uh, form is also size tunnel in Palau and that is all lit by the camera the camera decides how much light's going to come in doesn't matter how how strong you blast your strobes you're never going to light up the blue of the ocean so that you decide with the camera your strobe light is literally only there to light up your subject so you need to mentally separate ambient light and subject lighting and that is Ambient light is what happens with the manual mode in your camera and subject lighting is what you do with your strobe. So here's another example of a, uh, a more macro like picture, but essentially the fact that we can see my buddy diver there in the back is not because my strobes have anything to do with it. If I would take the picture without strobes, you would see him just as much. You can see the tank, the back of his tank is lit up by the sunlight. Right? That is essentially the camera letting in enough light that that picture information travels all the way to the lens. But the uh, zebra batfish in the front is a result of me using strobe light on this animal. So that is where we use subject lighting. Right? Here you've got the same tiger shark, same spot. This is in Fiji. I'm in the, exactly the same spot. The shark is in the same spot as well, just on a different swim by. But I'm creating a totally different effect. That is essentially same fish, same place, same time, but different settings. 
that's because I'm using my camera in manual mode to create how much backlight do I want to come in, how much ambient light do I want to allow. Which is why when people often ask me like how do you do black background photos, it's like the easiest thing in the world. Essentially, you tell your ambient light by the camera that there's no light. You set it that the camera doesn't detect any light. And then you add strobe light. And then that's the only thing you're going to see. So that's how you do black background photos. You just darken the picture with your camera as much as possible until it's pretty dark and then you start adding strobe light. Again, that's going to be a big part in section two. So how do I achieve these different effects? How do I make the camera take darker photos, essentially? That is by understanding these two and knowing how you can make your camera create these two. Right? And there are the three things that you need to know about the camera, which is essentially your ISO, your shutter speed, and your aperture. In classic photography teaching, that's called the uh, Holy Trin Trinity, right? So the three things. And these three are interfering with each other, right? The three influence each other because they all are about how much light you bring in. I actually changed that to what I call the pyramid of light, trademark pending. That is essentially my solution of how you can make it easier for yourself with this triangle of light underwater, right? So this... Um, is gonna, what I'm going to be discussing in the next part. So for those who have no idea of what aperture and shutter speed is, just wait for it next time. But for those who do, um, just as a repetition, ISO is obviously the sensor of your frame. The shutter speed tells you how long you let light in and the aperture how much at the same amount of time. But the effects are totally different. And the way I use it, the reason I put it into this pyramid is because the higher in the pyramid, the more often you use it. So your ISO, you might not change very often. So at one depth, in one area, you might only use one type of ISO. You will not change that. So you can forget about it until you change situation or until you change the entire style from bright to dark. The shutter speed is determined by your speed and the animal speed. So if you're swimming hard and you're swimming with a whale shark, you don't want to sh use a slow shutter speed because you're moving the camera and the shark's moving. But if the animal is slow, then you can take a slow shutter speed. So if I'm taking 100,000 photos of one nudibranch, that nudibranch is not moving. So I can pretty much fix my shutter speed and not worry about the shutter speed anymore. The aperture has an influence on how good you see the background, right? And so the background sharpness is what you decide with the aperture. But you can use this as well for brightening and darkening your photo. So this is the way I stack it up. The aperture is what you would control more often in certain situations than the ISO. And finally, it's your flash. So the last thing that you do that you adjust is the strobe light. And there's actually a difference between how we do it for wide angle, or how I do it for wide angle, and how for macro. Because in wide angle, right, in wide angle, we have animals that are very fast, mostly. Right? Lots of reef fish or uh, manta rays or sharks or turtles, they're moving fast. So therefore, my ISO is fixed through the situation. The shutter speed is fixed because it's a fast animal. And the aperture actually uh, is the only thing that I can use to constantly adjust my camera brightness. So if I'm taking photos of you know animals in wide angle, I memorize how much turn of my dial changes how much in the aperture. I can use my aperture from you know 7.1 to whatever 14 or or more and so i'll just remember okay one dial is three stops on the aperture and then if i take the picture and i see oh it's too dark i can just dial it down and i have th three larger stops right and so i'm using the aperture to fine-tune my brightness Whereas in macro, where we want to create a certain effect and the animals are actually not moving very much, we can fix our aperture and use the shutter speed to fine tune. So that's why you can stack up the pyramid differently when you're shooting wide angle or macro. Anyway, I'm going to cover all that uh, in the next one. Now I want to come to my secret, Simon's secret on how to be ready for your shot. And that is essentially the secret of the test shot. If you go diving with me, you will often see me uh, take photos of my hand and that is essentially the test shot and I do that before the situation comes so every time I drop in the water the first thing I do is take a picture of my hand 
What does that tell me? It tells me how dark the background is, how strong my strobes are, and essentially I can do that because I can delete all these photos uh, in Lightroom later. So for those who didn't join my Lightroom uh, session, look at session one. I'm showing you how easy you can delete all these photos. You can just mark all these test photos, press X and they're all gone. Right? But what I'm doing is I'm making myself ready that my cameras are on the handset. Right? So this allows me to be ready. Here you can see a series on the same situation until I actually get the strobe light right. So the background lighting is a bit brighter later than it is before. You can see it's a bit darker. So I've changed something uh, in the settings. But you can also see how the lighting is changing on the hand. Right? You can see first the left strobe is really strong, actually the first three photos, and then on two the, the, the strobe light is too weak, and on the last one both strobe lights are strong enough. And so, you know, now I'm ready if something comes at this depth to take the right photograph. And you should test everything that you need for the photo. So you should take the, you know, the settings, how you need your camera, how does the sun come in, like the photo that you see behind me here with the hammerheads, that's not something we just snap. You have to fine tune it and make sure you're ready for that one moment where these hammerheads swam above us in Cocos, you know, that, that didn't happen all the time. We were waiting there for a while, so I was always setting myself up because this is the photo that I wanted. So I knew already that these photos could happen, so I needed to take test shots, making sure that I had the light the, the, right, uh, the light right. And then I was hoping that one hammerhead was going to come closer and my strobes would have been ready for that hammerhead. Right? That is the last thing that you need to do is your, your uh, strobe power. So if you take a picture of your hand, you're obviously only aware of what your hand uh, distance would cover. And sometimes the animals will be further away. So if you think that animals are going to come as close as your hand, you need to actually make the strobe light stronger than what you need to do your hand. Because if the, your hand is about a meter away, if the subject is going to be two meters away, you actually need twice the power. So that's something that you need to keep in mind. So when you take the test shot, your hand should actually be overexposed. So this is my... Uh, my uh, um, recommendation. So first of all, take a test shot of your hand before a situation happens. So before you try to get close to this, uh, you know, rhinopia or mimic octopus, take some shots of your hand first. If you're doing macro, you can take a picture of your thumb, but you take it so you don't do it when you're right in front of the subject. You do it before you go in, right? And also you do it just in case, for any case. So when you see diving with me, every 10 meters of depth, I will actually change my camera settings because who knows what's going to come by, right? So at 10 meters, I have much more sunlight and much more reds and much more, uh, 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 you know, blue water than I have at 30 meters. So if we're dropping down to 30 meters and then we're shallowing up, you need to change your settings, right? So that is essentially my recommendation. Uh, Manjula is asking... Um, what settings do I take with the hand shot? That depends, you know, if, if I'm at, at 30 meters, I'm going to take it with whatever settings. The point is, I'm trying to achieve the effect by taking a photo of my hand, then trying to practice on animals. Of course, if you're taking rec photos in Colombo, then you can do your test shots on the rec because the rec's not moving, right? But if you're trying to get good photos with a shark, it would really help you if you take the test shots of your hand first, so when the shark comes, all you need to do is go snap, 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 snap. That is the idea of the test shot. And I find very often that has been my the, the changing uh, element in how I can turn around photos. When we get the situation, I'm ready faster because I'm just practicing it on my hand than waiting for the animal to, and take the first photo. So that is um, the summary of what we talked about today, right? So try to make photos that are pretty, tell a story and have a surprising element and try to be ready for that with the things that I've mentioned. So that was uh, what I wanted to cover today. Next time we're going to talk about your camera in detail. Uh, Deepen or Dipen, I'm not sure how I say your name. Um, I am going to talk about uh, uh, compact cameras next week as well. So on your G16, you definitely can use uh, macro mode. Uh, sorry, manual mode. Um, that first uh, picture of the octopus that you saw was the first picture I ever got printed. That was actually shot with a S95, right? So, um, oops. 
Um, questions. So let me just look here through the Q&A what I didn't see. So Teresa's, I think I've already answered. Um, so Teresa is saying background color via the shutter speed. That is also not wrong. You definitely can use the shutter speed to adjust the brightness of your picture, but it depends what subject you're taking a picture of, right? So that, that's very important. Um, Dipen is asking to add my strobe as a TTL strobe with no other settings. Yeah, so um, again, I will talk about that next week, but a TTL strobe with a compact camera is basically means the camera has no influence on what the strobe does. So TTL normally means through the lens, so the light gets through the camera, the camera decides the power of the strobe. But because you're using a compact camera and the strobe is only connected through an optical cable, cable optical cable, um, you essentially can't have TTL. So what you actually have is STTL. So smart TTL, which means the strobe decides how strong to fire. And that's kind of not very helpful because the strobe doesn't know if my subject is here or if my subject is there. So that's a problem with TTL strobes, but we'll definitely talk about it next time. So no, this talk is not only about SLR. All cameras nowadays have manual mode. You just have to use it. Uh, Mandy is asking if I have always a starting point for my settings. Um, that really depends. So if you go in the water in Palau, as you saw, many of my good photos are from Palau because it's perfect conditions, clear water, nice blue water, uh, you know, uh, a, a good, good situation to take photos and it's usually sunny, right? But if you take photos like in Hong Kong where I was just diving two days ago, there it's not so easy because we don't have that much light. And essentially every situation is different. But what I do is I go down, take the first few shots in my hand and I adjust the settings. So for example, in the beginning, I will decide if I'm gonna be using ISO to adjust the base level. And, and then I work from there. So it's not a starting point. I just look at the picture and see if we're too dark, then I start with ISO and, and the other settings. Right? Thank you. Um, Okay, so Chang is asking which macro lens you should take, Nikon 60 or 105? Different from a person prefer 105, you know, working this way, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so the 105 has, uh, a, I, I like both lenses and I would take both, but in Hong Kong, most of the time I would take the 60 just because we don't get that many really small things. And with that 105, you just get quite small, uh, you can only, sort of take things that are sort of three centimeters and smaller. Um, and with the 60 millimeter, you can also do fish portraits. You can do, uh, you can take small corals. You can take really, really small things with a diopter. And you have a little bit less uh, limitation in terms of working distance when you use the, the 60. So I generally use the 60 90% uh, of the time than the 105. Another thing is for the 105, you get a lot of focus problems. So unless you've got a very easy thing to focus, so if you ever try a 105 on a black water dive, you will see it's quite problematic. So that's why I usually take both lenses and I take the 105 only if I know I'm gonna be doing pygmy seahorses or sheep nudies or anything like that. Okay, Shaf is asking for green water photography. Well, it's very easy. When the water is green, you take green water photography, you know? I mean, the brightness of the sunlight is still the same thing. So if you're gonna go uh, in a lake in Switzerland, it will very strongly depend if it's a clean water, like a clear water lake or a, a turbid, you know, water. So essentially it, it doesn't really change except that you need to brighten the camera if it's darker. Um, if you remember from the Lightroom session, we were using Michael's photo there from Dubai where he went in this like super green soup uh, in a wreck at 40 meters. He had to shoot that with 2000 ISO because it was super dark. So you might not have the choice, but I think green water photos can be very interesting in my personal opinion. Yeah, so uh, Liga is uh, saying that it's a lot of effort to take the photo. That is why I'm saying you should use your hand to take the picture before the animal comes. So if you take the photo before the shark comes or the manta ray comes, then at least you've got your setting ready. And then when the shark comes, you can take your photo, you know. So that is, of course, it takes practice and you will, you know, need to do it several times. Uh, but if you start using your hand, also on a boring dive, you can try all kinds of techniques. So for example, uh, uh, slow shutter, what we talked about earlier, 
um, you know, that's quite difficult to actually get it right. So I just practice on my hand. Like if there's nothing else to do, I'll put the camera to 120 or, uh, or sorry, to one, uh, 120 or 110 or 115 and just see, okay, my, move my hand this fast, that's how much shutter I get. If I move it this fast, that's how much happens. I put it to one fifth. Okay, now what happens, right? And you just practice. And then when the shot comes, you know, okay, in my case, for example, I get my best slow shutter um, with like one twentieth, right? So I know already, I know I need one twentieth. So I set my aperture, my ISO to support one twentieth. And then I'm ready to do that pretty quickly with the shark. So it's just practicing and use your hand to practice. I know that sounds really wrong. Sorry, ladies, but you need to use your hand to practice. Um, any more question? Okay, Teresa, if your kit's so heavy, that means you have to put buoyancy in, right? So let me just hang on one second. I'll show you. Depending on my setup, I use all kinds of different float arms. Right? So this is a thicker float arm, this is a medium sized float arm, this is a thin float arm, and they all have different buoyancy. Also with these floats, you can create more buoyancy. And what you should try and get is you should try and get your set to be neutrally buoyant. Maybe a little bit negative, but definitely you don't want it to be super heavy. You can also get really strain on your hand and so on. So generally the best case is if you let go of your camera underwater, it should either stay neutral or slowly drift down. And that allows you to also manage your camera much better underwater. And then you can also very easily take a photo like that. Yeah, no, you need to, Teresa, you need to play with that. You need to just let, you know, make sure you get it neutral. Um, okay, so I'm, Daniel, I'm going to say what you can do uh, while you're stuck on land. Um, I'll get there. Yeah. The sponge float you can put onto the to the metal arms or you just get more of these floats like you can uh, get a lot of these you can put up to four on one arm um yeah uh cheng is asking about the sync uh sync cords um i'm going to talk more about the sync cords next session but i do still use sync cords because i have an slr so you can do ttl but also the connection is much more stable um, and uh, you don't need to use the built-in flash to fire them. So I still use the sync cord, uh, but you can also get uh, the um, uh, LED triggers. Right? Okay, any more questions? 3D printing arms for better buoyancy. Uh, 3D printing is not going to last very long. So, I mean, the arms are very rugged. You're moving the arms around a lot. Like, I move my strobe arms all the time. I don't think your uh, 3D arms would last very long. Um, if there are no other questions, let me just point out a couple more things, guys. What you can practice is you can use your rule of thirds and compositioning on your old photos. So go through your Lightroom catalog and just recut some of your photos, seeing if maybe now you're getting a bit better rule of thirds going, right? And look at your very best photos and see if maybe something has changed. If thinking about the picture a bit differently may make a picture uh, better or worse. Maybe the photos that you really like, like when I first started, I had some of my really favorites and I would show them everybody on the phone. And then when I did a bit of research into the rule of thirds, I realized that I often messed up a lot of the photos and now they would never be uh, in my selection of best photos. Right? Another thing I wanted to mention is I have a Facebook group uh, that I started for the Lightroom people. So that's a photography only group. So you know we have the Insider Divers community. This is another Facebook group only for photos. So you can post your photos. I'll give you feedback there. You can post questions there as well. So if you just add this one, um, I'll put it into um, the notes as well after after the talk. Right? Uh, yeah, I'll post the link. Oh, I could post it. Hang on a second. I'm just gonna. Oops. That's a good point. I'm just gonna put this group into um, the webinar chat, everybody. Yeah. So it's now in the webinar chat. So I hope you can copy it there. And um, otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll put it into um, the Facebook link that I'm gonna create later. 
Okay. Um, just one more thing, guys. I wanted to mention if you want to do individual sessions, I do those as well. So we do it roughly by the hour, but we can do anything you want. Uh, we can talk through Lightroom editing. Uh, we can edit your photos together. We can talk about your camera setup. We can discuss your portfolio or prepare you for, uh, you know, your first competition submission or whatever. So if you want, just message me and we can do one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching as well. Uh, one thing, guys, I really need to tell you, please sign up for this talk on Wednesday. Um, this is uh, Tobias Friedrich. If you haven't heard the name, then uh, you're missing out. This is one of the biggest photographers in the last you know, five to ten years. Uh, uh, definitely uh, one of the biggest names. Has won a lot of the awards. Um, a really, really amazing photographer. And he's just the kind of guy who takes really, really exciting photos. So make sure you join on that on Wednesday. We're almost full, so make sure you register for that. Um, I have some more sessions coming up. So next week, Monday, we've got a professional videographer talking about underwater videos. So I'm uh, going to talk a lot about uh, how to take photos and even if you're taking GoPro, how to uh, make the most out of it. Also, our tech insider, uh, Phil Kristoff, is going to do an introduction to tech um, about extending your bottom time. So the different routes into tech diving, taking a little bit, uh, um, uh, taking away the fear of, um, uh, uh, of tech diving. Uh, and also, I've got Dr. Peter Hauk from the Guam University um, as a marine biologist, and he's going to talk about corals, coral reefs, and fisheries. Fisheries For those people that ask me about do something for coral reefs, we've got that. Also, I've got, uh, for the shark lovers, I've got Elke talking this weekend about oceanic white tips in the Red Sea. And we've got Andy Cornish in a few weeks um, doing a shark and ray talk so about shark conservation and ray conservation and also i just added that so that's not in here yet i got uh, james begerman to do a talk about humpback whales uh, mostly shot in hawaii Niue, and alaska so you definitely want to join for that as well that's next friday so just always check insider academy guys there's i'm constantly posting new um uh, new uh, topics there and new speakers so make sure you always uh, check there and uh, yeah follow me on facebook please um uh, join the facebook community uh, instagram you know it and um yeah if there are no more questions then i think we should wrap up i did over do it again by time. I'm really sorry for that. But if there are any more questions, otherwise I would end the talk here. No more questions? Then I want to say thank you very much and thank you for your attention. It was really great having you and hope to see you also in two weeks for the next part. Have a good one. Bye bye. Welcome. Thanks, guys. Bye, Kaylee.